Our first speaker for today is Brother Bruce Stulting. He's originally from and born in Carnes City, Texas. He graduated from the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989. That's where I met him. He had to even put up with me there for a couple of years. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, that's fine with me if that's the way you want it. I don't <laughs> and uh, he has done uh, some graduate program work at the Memphis School of Preaching, 98 to 2000. Done local work in Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas. He's now been with the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville since 2001. He also serves there as one of the elders. He's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia. In fact, I hadn't seen him in a long time, and this goes back to the 90s, and we were in the Philippines, and all of a sudden there we were meeting over there. So it's a small world. Um, he preaches gospel meetings and speaks on several lectureships, co has conducted uh, some evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, worked uh, with uh, several Bible youth camps, and has served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, and he works with us when we are able to get things going in the Truth Bible Institute. And he has uh, and is directing the Lone Star Bible Camp now. At least I think he's still going to do that this summer. <laughs> so um, we're very happy to have him with us. But he's, he's one of these tent maker preachers. He also works for the Texas Department of Transportation. You know, uh, there was a great concern about, you know, government work and Here's 15 people standing around a hole, one of them sort of digging, everybody else leaning on their shovels. You ever notice that? It really scared all of the people in the nation a while back because they learned that the Chinese had invented a way that you couldn't lean on the shovels. And they didn't know what they were going to do. But Bruce still has this outlet, and that is preaching the gospel, which he does well. He stands up for what is right. And we're thankful that he's with us with his wife, Sue. But I want you to watch Sue. She is a Dr. Pepper addict. And when I mentioned something about that while ago, she reaches down the purse and pulls out a bottle. So watch her back there. You fish hatchery folks sitting right behind her. If she gets that bottle, just take it out of her hand. Escort her out. And... Yeah, yes, she does. Bruce? How do you keep control of that most of the time? Well, just stay with your subject. You'll handle that a whole lot better. His subject is the fatal error on Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, 28 through 32. Please come and speak to us. I think I'll survive. Might, might melt. Why? You know, I remember a Superman movie years ago that had Richard Pryor in it, and he worked for a company in the accounting department. And somebody mentioned to him that when they figure out the pay for someone for that week, they take the hours that they work, the rate of pay, they do the math, and it always comes out, but it's generally not an even number. There's always like maybe a half a cent left over, right? And they said that that half a cent was just out there somewhere. Well, Richard Pryor wrote a program that took all those half cents and put them on a pay voucher for him, and he got, at the end of the week, all those half cents. It came out to thousands of dollars. Now, Gene Hill told me that the preachers have been... <laughs> Stopping short and leaving some time left over, maybe a minute here or a minute there, two minutes. And so he suggested that I make a deal with David Brown to just gather up all those extra minutes and make use of them in my lesson. So rather than the regular 40 minutes, I ought to have a few extra minutes, right, David? I didn't even see it. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> All right, but anyway, it's good to be here. Appreciate everybody in attendance this morning. Uh, appreciate this lectureship and the theme very much, Fatal Error on the Holy Spirit. Seems like every so often we have to fight the same battles that we fought years and years ago. And part of the reason for that, I believe, is that once we win the battles, we kind of set that aside. We've won it. 
we don't have to deal with it anymore. And then because we don't preach on these subjects often enough and refresh our minds on it often enough, then that error creeps back in until it starts to take over again. And then we say, hey, wait, we got we to gotta deal with this. Whereas we should have been, you know, doing some preventive maintenance along the way, preaching on it from time to time and keeping it fresh on our brethren's memory and mind. And then we maybe wouldn't have this big of division in the Lord's church over this issue that we've fought and fought and fought and won years ago. But here we are again talking about some of the th same things. And it is pertinent, this lectureship. The theme is pertinent for our times. There's a lot of error being propagated on the, the Holy Spirit and his work. And I uh, appreciate the elders uh, at this congregation and their wisdom to have this lectureship dealing with these problems. Joel's prophecy. Joel 2, verse 28 through 32. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 21, the fulfillment of that prophecy. So this lesson is going to deal with error taught on the Holy Spirit based on this prophecy. Uh, in a lectureship like this, it's invariably uh, that we're going invariable that we're going to cover probably some of the same material that one of the other speakers is going to deal with, and so that's the case with this lesson. We're going to have to deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, duration of miracles uh, because that that those are two errors taught on uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy. Job prophesied of miraculous gifts which would take place. Peter applied this prophecy to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, this outpouring initially came upon the twelve apostles and later to those upon whom the apostles laid their hands so they could receive a miraculous gift. Also the Holy Spirit was poured out in the household of Cornelius in a limited way in Acts chapter 10. Uh, this allowed them to speak in tongues in order to prove to the Jews that salvation also was extended to the Gentiles. And, of course, that's uh, Acts chapter 10 uh, is the occurrence, the account of that, uh, 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 I guess, event. And then chapter 11 is Peter's explanation to the Jews about what transpired. So let's read Joel 2. Verse 28 through 32. This is what Joel says. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And it will show wonders in the heavens and the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Uh, the sun shall... Uh, the sun... Uh, shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall, he, uh, shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So that's Joel's prophecy. Now in Acts chapter 2 beginning of verse 16 we have the fulfillment of that. Remember, Peter speaking. This is in response to the outpour of the Holy Spirit, the uh, apostles speaking in tongues, and the response of the people. They were amazed that they all heard uh, in their own language. And some even mocked the apostles. But Peter then explains. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and, all, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out, pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 21. And so 
of interest of it to us is what are the last days? And so some believe that uh, Peter is speaking of the Christian dispensation. This is because there will be no more laws given other than the law of Christ. So this would be the last days, according to some. Uh, the problem with this view is the promise of miraculous gifts is in this passage is upon people throughout this time period. And so if it is uh, speaking of the Christian dispensation, then some would believe that the miraculous age would still exist today. Now, a much more likely answer, and one which fits the context, is that prophecy, is that prophecy, is of the last days of the Jewish system. When someone says the last days are here, you would expect the end of that thing to be near. In AD 70, God made sure that the Christian dispensation was over with the destruction of Jerusalem. All the temple records were lost. The temple was destroyed. The priesthood was disbanded. No one could prove their lineage back to Levi. Uh, so the priesthood is over. And with all of those things in AD 70, then if that is the last days, at the end of that time in AD 70, that would be the end of the miraculous age. Now, some people would still maintain that uh, the miraculous age continued past that. I don't necessarily have a problem with that because we can show from the scriptures that the miraculous age did not continue to the second coming of Christ. Okay, and we're going to deal with that a little bit later in our lesson. Um, there is no means today by which an individual can possess the ability to perform miracles. We need to get that in mind and keep it in mind because this is where a lot of people uh, err. In the first century, people received spiritual gifts by two possible means. The first means is by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, such as occurred on the day of Pentecost with the apostles. Later on in Acts chapter 10, in a limited way, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles who spoke in tongues. And that was to demonstrate again, as we said, the acceptance of God of the Gentiles through the sacrifice of Christ. That the plan of salvation applied to the Gentiles as well. And so the second means by which miraculous gifts were given was by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now this is the only two possible ways in the New Testament that people were able to perform miracles. And when we say the miraculous age is ended, we're talking about the ability for the Holy Spirit to work through individuals to perform miracles. That ceased, and we're going to prove that in the course of this lesson. So in the first century, uh, we had people upon whom the apostles laid their hands and imported the Holy Spirit are one of the nine spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now the apostles were the only ones who could impart spiritual gifts by the laying on of hands and thus give others the power to perform miracles. Now, this is clearly taught in the New Testament. When we think about Acts chapter 8, when the Samaritans were converted, uh, Philip goes there, preaches the gospel. People are converted. And then in Acts chapter 8 and verse 18, we have to have Simon or Peter and John leave Jerusalem, make the trip to Samaria, and lay hands on those people to impart spiritual gifts. That's the only way that they would be able to get it. Notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He made that connection. I believe there's a lot of people that don't make that connection between the laying on the apostles' hands and the ability of someone to do miraculous uh, uh, gifts or, or possess a, a miraculous gift. It was through the laying on of the apostles' hands, Simon understood that, wanted to buy that ability. He thought it was something he could purchase. Well, we know the rest of the story. That was uh, when Peter rebuked him because he didn't have part or lot in that. Nobody else had the, a part or lot in that ability, only the apostles. 
course, we're talking about here when they received the Holy Spirit, it was the ability to do uh, one of the miraculous gifts. There's no instance after the house of Cornelius where any person had the power to perform miracles unless the hands of the apostles were laid upon them. As the apostles died and those upon whom they had laid their hands died, miraculous gifts ceased because the source is gone. And, and so when we think about the the ability to perform miracles when the apostles died, no one else could have hands laid on them and receive the gift. And when those that had the gift died, miracles ceased. That's the extent to which miracles existed in the first century. Now let's move on to Holy Spirit baptism. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, the apostle Paul, as he lists the unity of the 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 things regarding the unity of the Spirit says that there's only one baptism. Now, I'm not real smart, but I can count to one. And I, how many people can count to one? I hope everybody here can count to one uh, because it's essential to understand this point in this lesson. All right? One. It's the loneliest number, right? When we think about one, that's something that's unique, that's by itself, okay? It's significant that there's only one baptism now. At the, re, at the writing of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul says there's only one baptism, okay? Only one, not two, not three, not ten, but only one. Now we think about this number. Is it not possible to determine which one baptism is in effect today? We have to, of course, go to the scriptures. And when we think about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, it doesn't really give us any hint in the Greek language which baptism this is. It just calls it a baptism. Okay? It doesn't say whether it's water baptism or Holy Spirit baptism or baptism by fire or the baptism of suffering, uh, the baptism of Moses. Uh, it, see, it just doesn't define it. But what it does tell us is that there's only one. Okay? Now, the two prominent possibilities here is Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism. And so we're going to limit our discussion to those two. Which one is it? And remember, the Greek word simply means to immerse or dip or overwhelm. And so when we think about this, let's, let's consider. So about 30 years before Paul wrote to the Ephesians on Acts chapter 2, there were two baptisms. There was Holy Spirit baptism. That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And then there's baptism in water, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. So at Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church, there's two baptisms there. But by the time Paul writes Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, we've narrowed it down to one. So which one is it? Holy Spirit baptism or is it water baptism? Okay. Now, we think about this, immediately we might conclude <coughs> that one of those baptisms has been done away. Suppose uh, that you went out and you met a lady in the park and she had two sons, fine looking boys, young boys, and one was named John and one named Joe. Thirty years later, you see this same lady again somewhere else and you ask the lady, so how's your sons? And she says, well, I only have one son, John. What are you going to think about Joe? Something happened to Joe, right? Because she only has one son now, and that's John. So if we had two baptisms on the day of Pentecost, and 30 years later, Paul says we only have one, then what are we going to think? Well, one of them's gone. Something happened to one of them. Now, our point today is which one is continuing. 
which one is left and which one has been done away. So let's first consider Holy Spirit baptism. We think about this. In preparing the way for the Lord, John, the baptizer, told his followers of ways in which they could identify the Christ. And he said one such way was that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. Thus we learn that Jesus was the only administrator of Holy Spirit baptism. Well, you might think, well, that's quite a leap. How do we get from he's going to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire to he's the only one? Well, we need to remember that this was going to be evidence that Jesus was the Christ. And if somebody else had that ability, it wouldn't be really a good sign, would it? This had to be something unique to Jesus that he alone would be able to do. So Holy Spirit baptism, if it's evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, then it has to be something that's unique to him. And it is. Now, that function was Christ alone. It was only his. <coughs> Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. If you want to take notes, write these verses down. John 1 and verse 33. Luke 24 verse 49. John 15, 26, and 16 and verse 7. Those last two verses is the promise of Jesus to send the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to the apostles. <clears throat> Furthermore, Jesus had the authority to send the Holy Spirit. No human being can claim the authority to send the Holy Spirit. Just can't do it. Only Jesus, a member of the Godhead, has the ability to send the Holy Spirit to anyone. It was a promise by Jesus and received only by certain people of the first century. We've already seen the apostles and on a limited way the household of Cornelius. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus said to the eleven, remember Judas had not been replaced as yet, he said, For G John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The promise was further extended to Matthias, who replaced Judas, Acts 1, verse 15 through 26, and also Saul of Tarsus, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8 and 9, apostle called out of due season. Now, let's consider water baptism. Oh, thank you. You're all right. I don't care what your brother says about you. All right. Thank you very much. Water baptism. Baptism for remission of sins is commanded by Peter. Now, we're going to contrast these in charts in the book, if you want to go there just a minute. It's commanded by Peter to Cornelius' his household uh, to be baptized in water. Who can be who can withhold water, these should be baptized. And then he commanded them to be baptized. Acts chapter 10, verse 47 to 48. So water baptism commanded by Peter immediately following Holy Spirit baptism. So here in Acts chapter 10, we have the two baptisms back to back. In Acts chapter 2, we have the two baptisms, Holy Spirit baptism on the apostles. Later we have it commanded by those that responded to Peter's and to the to the, the sermon recorded on Pentecost. What shall we do? Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of sins. Acts 2.38. It was to be performed in the name of the Lord. Baptism in the name of the Lord is for remission of sin. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. In other words, the purpose was to wash away sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. So why tarries thou rise and be baptized? Doing what? Calling on the name of the Lord. Washing away thy sins. In summary, water baptism is commanded and is for remission of sins. Now, <clears throat> washing of water is still in effect. That's the baptism that's still in effect. Paul called baptism the washing of water by the word. Was this baptism that was, was this the baptism that was to continue that was in existence in Acts, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. And we answer affirmative. A strong yes. 
He mentioned it in, in Ephesians 5 and verse 22. See also Titus 3, 5 in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. And so beyond a shadow of a doubt, water baptism was then in effect and still is. And so we ask, could this be the one baptism in Ephesians 4, 5? We think about the Great Commission. The Great Commission was to last throughout the Christian age. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning verse 18, Jesus says, All power is given to me on heaven and earth. And then he gives the, the commission, In your going, or as you go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. But he tells them, Whatsoever I have commanded you, teach them also. What did he just command them? To go into all the world and preach the gospel? Mark's account says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Every creature, he that believeth is baptized, shall be saved. Now this baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord, is to be taught to subsequent generations and carried out until he returns. You see, so when we think about the baptism of the, of the Great Commission, it, it is to last throughout the whole age. Now, from this statement, comparing Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, we infer that baptism for remission of sins was water baptism. Therefore, water baptism... For the purpose of being saved must last to the end of the Christian age or the second coming of Christ. Not only that, but the Great Commission with its baptism is for all nations. Remember, we're to go into all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. Now look at chart two in the book if you have a book. Is water baptism the one baptism? Well, it's commanded. It must be obeyed to avail benefits. It's performed by men. It's the same. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's for remission of sins, and it's to last to the end of the age. Now let's look at chart number three and look at Holy Spirit baptism. Is that the one baptism? Well, it was a promise. It cannot be obeyed. You don't obey a promise. You receive the promise. Right? It's no choice. I make a choice when I obey the gospel. When the household of Cornelius received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in limited fashion, that wasn't their choice. It happened to them. It was, it was performed on them. When it occurred, no mention made of the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not for remission of sins. And it discontinued by A.D. 62, and that's implied by Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Now, what is the one baptism? Contrast. Water baptism is commanded. Holy Spirit baptism is a promise. Must obey water baptism in order to receive the benefits. You cannot obey the promise. You don't have a choice. It's performed only by men. Holy Spirit baptism performed only by Christ. Water baptism is named of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No names mentioned in Holy Spirit baptism. Holy, water baptism is for remission of sins. Holy Spirit baptism is not for remission of sins. Water baptism lasts to the end of the age. Holy Spirit baptism ended before A.D. 62, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. It is a misuse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 to teach that water baptism in Involves Holy Spirit baptism. As we've already shown, the only baptism currently in effect is water baptism. Now it's coming up, and it's, it's here, that people are trying to say that the one baptism is one baptism that involves two elements, the Spirit and water. But when we look at the contrast, this chart number four clearly, distinctly shows two separate baptisms with two separate elements. And you can't mix the two. 
And that's what some people are trying to do. You can't do it. When it says we're all baptized by one spirit into one body, that doesn't mean we're baptized by the, or into the spirit. And in water, there's not two elements. Chart number 5 in the book. We're going to contrast John chapter 3 and verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, and Ephesians 5, 26, and finally Titus 3 and verse 5. Now we're going to go across the chart from left to right. John 3 and verse 5 says we're born of water. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says we're baptized. Ephesians 5 and verse 26 talks about the washing of water. Titus 3 and verse 5 also speaks of washing of water. And then the next part of John 3, 5 says that we're born of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, By one Spirit we're baptized into the body. Well, Ephesians 5 and verse 26, it says, Washing of water by the Word. And then Titus 3, 5, Wash the water, renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we have on one hand, born of the Spirit, by one Spirit. Then we have by the Word and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Why in, in one verse, Ephesians 5 and verse 26, do we have by the Word? And the other three verses we have by the Spirit. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. And then the, the result of this is John 3, 5, enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 into the body of Christ, Ephesians 5, 26, sanctified and cleansed, Titus 3, 5, we're saved. From the chart we learn, number one, being baptized is, is equivalent to being born of water and a washing of water. Being born of spirit is the, it, by one spirit and the renewing of the Holy Ghost is accomplished by the word. That's the tool, the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to get the job done. And then the, the result is that, you, uh, that one is sanctified and cleansed, thus saved, at which point one enters the body, which is the kingdom of God. So this is how we need to take these scriptures and not rip them out of their context, but keep them in their context and show how they teach the same thing only using different words, and then where the words are different, then we need to figure out why they're different. In this case, the difference is that the Holy Spirit works through the Word. He's not an element in water baptism, an, an extra element. Simply speaking, the Holy Spirit is involved in our conversion, in our salvation, in our sanctification, in an indirect way. And when I was, David mentioned that I, I was at Southwest School of Bible Studies when he was there. Well, I was there when Mac Deaver was there, and I was there when Roy Deaver was there. And this is exactly what I was taught by those men back in the late 80s. And I submit something's changed, and it's not the Bible. It still teaches the same thing that they taught back then. I remember Roy Deaver used the illustration about a woodsman chopping down a tree. Can we say that the woodsman chopped down the tree? Yes. The woodsman chopped down the tree. How did he do it? He didn't physically chop down the tree with his own hand, but he used an instrument, an axe. The axe is what contacted the tree, not the woodsman. The Holy Spirit, when he converts us, is involved, just like the axeman's involved. But if you take away the axe from the axeman, he'll never get the tree chopped. You take the word away from the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be converted. Because this is the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses. I remember another illustration they used. Here's the Holy Spirit. Here's the human heart. You do this. That's spirit on spirit. This is the way the Bible teaches. Here's the spirit. Here's the Bible. Here's the human spirit. And that's how it works. The Holy Spirit contacts the human spirit through the word. 
Something's changed and it's not the Bible. Something's changed. It's not the Bible. The one baptism, Ephesians 4 and verse 5, is water baptism. It is the act of, of obedience by which people are admitted into the one body, the one church. It is the occasion when the precious blood of Christ is applied to wash away sins. The one baptism has a unifying effect throughout the church throughout all ages. Galatians 3 verse 26 through 29. Those who claim to have two or more baptism foster division as do those who teach different design or purpose for baptism. Now, the cessation of miracles. Contrary to proper denominational belief, miracles do not continue today. I'm talking about the ability for humans, uh, as they did in the first century, to perform miracles. We've been talking about this somewhat in Bible class at Fish Hatchery Road, there's between uh, providence, miracles, and natural events. And when we think about <clears throat> miracles in the Bible, they were a distinct act. There was no question about it. When a miracle occurred, they could say, look, a notable miracle has occurred among us, and we can't deny it. Okay? Think about this. When Jesus was out healing the sick, casting out demons, feeding the 5,000, or whatever the miracle was, and from time to time when he wanted to go and, and be by himself, what did the people do? They, they tracked him down. They found it. They wanted access to those miracles because they, this was the real thing. Now think about that. that. That word spread by word of mouth, right? Where's the news story? What would happen if, if a true Bible miracle occurred today? It would be on Facebook. Oh, there you go. It would be on Facebook. Right? The whole world would know about it. In, in, in an instant. The news cameras would be there. Notable miracles being performed in our presence. It's undeniable. Do we, do we see that anywhere? Where are the photographers? Where's the cameraman? Where's the news story? Oh, we have plenty of, of, of documentaries about Benny Hinn or somebody like him, Oral Roberts. Supposedly being able, you know what's interesting about Oral Roberts? A few years ago, well, a few decades ago now, I forgot how old I was. He built a hospital, raised millions of dollars, going to build a hospital in Oklahoma, right? And he says, if we build this hospital, we're going to have medical research and we're going to cure all these diseases, and we're going to do this and that. And my, I re, I'm like wanting to raise my hand and say, wait a minute, if you can perform miracles and heal people the way you claim you can, why do you need a hospital? See? Out there in front of Oral Roberts University, they had them big praying hands. It's a huge statue. I drove by there one time, saw them stand a statue like this, and then, then I rode by there a few months later, and I saw that one was like this. <laughs> That's why they want those hospitals. That's why they want that university. Because they can't perform miracles. And the reason they can't is because the age of miracles has ceased. First Corinthians, I'm not going to have time to finish this. David's already not going to give me my extra minutes I put in for those are just going to be left out in the ether somewhere. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul's showing the brethren a better way. At the end of chapter 12, in his discussion of miracles, he talks about how the, those miracles were used in the first century to edify and build up the church. It wasn't for anybody's personal benefit or glory. But at the end of that chapter, he says, yet I show you a better way. And the next, very next chapter, he starts in, in those first few verses, and talks about love. You know, people that want to claim modern day miracles want to go back to an inferior system. Those miracles were used for the instruction and edification of the brethren and we now have that which is perfect, the complete revelation. That's down in verses 8 through 10. Where he talks about 
whether they be tongues or prophecy or knowledge, that's going to be done away. That's going to cease. That's going to end when that which is perfect or complete comes. And that's the Bible. I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of this because there's more in the book. But the fact is, those miracles were only for a brief period of time to reveal and confirm the message. And once that message was complete, the need for those miracles was over. And now abides what? Faith, hope, and charity or love. These three. And the greatest of these is love. So if we want to go back to modern day miracles, Paul says you're going back to an inferior system. Why not take what he's given us? apply it to our lives, and we would have the faith, hope, and love that God wants us to have. And that's a far better way than the way of miracles. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your freedom. Something wrong with a lot of these preachers are giving time back. That was a that was a good lesson. I'm I'm surprised. I mean, uh, I <laughs> really appreciate Bruce. It was a good way to get things started off today. Always will be an important study of the work of the Holy Spirit. And what he said at the beginning has concerned me all my preaching career. That we fight a battle, we think we've won it, and then everybody drops the ball for a generation, and here it comes back at us again, and we're surprised. When I was in my late teens and early 20s just starting to preach, uh, that was the situation. People were saying then when all this, I don't know whether you rem some of you remember it, that along about 65, things started going, you started hearing all sorts of things about the Spirit doing this, that, and the other. Neo yes, uh, it's now Neo-Neo. And I don't know how many Neos you have to put on it. But uh, the older preachers then said, we haven't been preaching on this enough. We dropped the ball. And for about 10 years there, there was a plethora of books produced and articles and such as that. And then all of a sudden, it fades away, uh, sort of when marriage, divorce, remarriage popped up and such as that. Then that sort of fades back. And MDR comes up and discussed for about 10 years. You're not hearing much about that anymore from places. So you're just going to have, have these things happening. It's just the way it works. That's the reason we're taught to preach the whole counsel of God. And every one of us as preachers working in the congregation ought to be realizing that. Because you have somebody born today, uh, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, if you didn't preach on a certain subject five years before they're born, it's a new world to them. So every generation needs the same thing repeated and discussed and gone over. And preachers who know the answers to things because they've fought the battles ought to be teaching such a way as to show these things, referring to these things, always. There has to be some sort of, of connection. I was in, yes, sir. Another thing, I think our members aren't being indoctrinated as well as they have been in the past. And so we don't have the members that are knowledgeable on this as well. Well, that's exactly right. Um, of course, just trying to get people to read the Bible just to understand what God tells them to do is, is, a, is a constant battle. But be that as it may, um, when I was in Muskogee, that was when in Tulsa they were building that hospital of Roberts. And uh, a dentist wrote an editor, I uh, wrote a letter to the editor of the paper there and just declaring what a wonderful thing this was that that thing was being built. Well, I was writing a lot of letters, uh, letters, editors, uh, letters to the editor at that time and had a pretty good relationship with that editor. And um, I guess he knew I was going to say things most everybody didn't. In fact, one time he, he sent my letter back to me and says, if you can reduce it down a little bit, said, I want to print it. I never had that happen before or since. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just wrote back and, and, and mentioned that very contradiction. I said, who ever heard in the study of the Bible a warning to build a hospital, especially when a miracle worker who claims they can work miracles right and left and healing people has been doing it for years and now they're doing this. Well, you didn't get any kind of kickback on that. They can't answer it. It's impossible to answer it. And that, that kind of thing goes and goes and goes. 
Well, we thank you very much again. We thank everybody for being here. We'll stand dismissed for till the top of the hour, which is about nine, eight, nine minutes. So thank you very much.